Um, so yeah, welcome um, officially to, to, to this um, edition of Herpla State in Manchester. Uh, so I will uh, I will host this meeting. Um, so uh, yeah, like, uh, unfamiliar uh, face here. Usually usually Rachel is doing it, uh, and and she's also here. Um, so general guidance for tonight: um, if you can be anything, be kind. Um, yeah, we're all in in tough situations at the moment. Um, so we want this to be a safe space, and um, we want us yeah us all to be kind to each other as well as to yourself uh, to make the most of of tonight. Um, yeah, Rachel already mentioned uh, just now, but in case you missed it or just logged in, um, this event is being recorded and shared via YouTube. Um, if you want to be uh, on the recording with your video, um, please turn on your video. It's always nice for everyone to see actual faces, especially yeah, in times uh, now that, that we're, we're having lots of calls and um, lots of me time um, so it's it's nice if you if you're if you're if you are happy with that to do turn on your video um, if uh, but if uh, if not that's perfectly fine too I know lots of our members um, choose not to not to turn on their videos uh, please do keep yourself muted uh, when not speaking uh, we all know how annoying not how annoying it can be to have any background noises um the chat is there uh, for you to ask questions um so we've previously uh attendees have have used the chat very actively as well as i think got very uh, good uh, answers to their questions uh, we will of course uh, have um after each speaker also um, a q a section as usual um but yeah in between uh please do use the chat um please do not share the zoom room link publicly because um, yeah there have been some um, some issues in the past not with our meetup but with other uh, events where this has happened um, so yeah please when you when you if you were to take any screenshots or anything please make sure that the zoom link is not on there so that we don't get any uh, any people jumping the meeting um, we have a code of conduct uh, so we want to uh, provide a respectful harassment free community for everyone. We don't tol tolerate any harassment or bullying. Uh, so if you have any uh, any problems with that, please reach out to any of us, um, Rachel, Bernie or me. Um, and we have a full code of conduct on the meetup page as well for you to review. Um, our mission is to bring together women with a connection to data, to provide a safe space where we can all support and celebrate each other's experiences and knowledge and establish meaningful connections and talk data. Um, so yeah, in the spirit, we've put together a great um, meetup for you all tonight, um, and we hope that we can uh, deliver on our mission uh, tonight for you all and together with you all. Uh, here are your organizers. Um, so I'm Mona, and um, yeah, I have, uh, actually I don't have um, you on the screen anymore because I only have one screen, so I can't see you, but uh, Rachel, Bernie, if you're there, uh, please do. Give Hello. Hi. Uh, so this is us. Um, yeah, the, um, these are some photos from our live events uh, a while ago now. Uh, and the, the community has kept on growing and growing. Um, and uh, yeah, more photos here. Uh, as you can see, um, we've had loads of events already. And the last few events um, have been a very successful virtual events. Uh, so we're quite happy that we've been able to, to carry on um, with all but one of our meetups monthly, uh, even though we had to um, yeah, sometimes have uh, change plans or um, yeah, it just wasn't as expected. Um, but um, yeah, here we are and we've been hosting our virtual meetups now for the last months. Um, our events are reliably on the second Thursday of each month. Um, the next one is um, on uh, 10th of September. Uh, online again, it will be our third birthday. And please do if, there, if um, you can see any collaboration with us or um, yeah, you would, you would like to be, be a speaker or suggest a speaker or suggest a topic, we're always open for your suggestions. Um, the meetup is really there for you. Um, and on that note of collaboration, uh, we've got a collaboration coming up actually next week 
uh, with Python uh, Northwest. Um, and uh, here are the speakers. So if you are specifically interested in Python, uh, please do do join. Um, and you can you can join. You can uh, sign up. Um, yeah, connect with us um, in any of these ways. Uh, we're on Meetup, Twitter, YouTube, Slack, and email. Um, and we will get back to you. Uh, so, so if there's anything that's on your mind, please do get in touch. Uh, huge thanks to Evolution Recruitment Solutions, Bernie, uh, for supporting our group and events, as well as to um, Rachel and the Software Sustainability Institute for covering the cost of our Meetup page, because that's actually not free. Um, and uh, today we've got three amazing speakers. Our topic is diversity in tech. We've got um, Tamana, uh, senior data scientist at Jake Land Rover. We've got Faye, who's a senior developer at uh, DWP Digital, and Hannah, who's a director at Engaging for Success. So really looking forward to tonight's talks and stories and questions. And it's already our 29th meetup, so it's, it's really been a while since we've been doing this now. Um, announcements, um, Black Lives Matter. Um, there is a GoFundMe page to raise fund for initiatives for, for Black Lives Matter. Uh, so if you are interested in, in contributing, um, please um, use that, that uh, page to do so. And it is time for our group photo. Uh, three, two, one. Awesome, thanks so much everyone. All right, so um, yeah, it's time for our speakers. So, can everyone see my presentation? Okay, it should be half half. So, um, hello, everybody. My name is Faye. I am a senior front end developer at the Department of Work and Pension Digital, and I'm also the founder of Code and Stuff and Code Possible. So, my career into tech is actually, um, <laughs> it was sort of like, when I tend to describe my journey, it's something I always classify as an happy accident, um, similar to what the Tamara also explained. I didn't really have an idea what I wanted to do. Um, when I left school or college, um, I ended up taking a gap year, but after a year I was like, I probably should do something. And I basically just um, applied for, um, I've always loved working with children, so I thought I'd do something around children. Um, so I went to university, graduated, uh, finished my degree, and I was like, okay, what, what am I doing? Um, I went to, luckily, I went to a teaching um, university, Agile, and a lot of all my colleagues and friends that I had made were all teachers. So I was like, well, I'll do, excuse me. So I thought, oh, well, I'll do a postgrad <laughs> in teaching. Um, uh, I finished out in 2014, but sadly, as much as I really enjoy teaching and being able to help shape um, children's foundation for their learning and development, um, it was very stressful and there was quite a lot going on in the background. There's so much that you're expected to do as well, um, but it was a profession where I didn't actually feel our place. A lot of other teachers were women. so. Um, there was quite definitely quite a lot of diversity in teaching. Um, for me, it was just something that I didn't think generally I'll be very happy doing in day in, day out. Um, so yeah, I decided teaching was it for me. So I was like, okay, let me get an office job. Um, for me, I've always been very conscious of where I wanted to work. Um, I've always wanted to be in a job where I feel like I'm giving back. It's always been like that for me since college, really. So um, co-op was just like a natural um, option because I quite like the fact that oh, I like the business model really um, it was all about the community and the people not just about making some rich guy richer um, which was something that I definitely um, was quite important to me so I started um, at the co-op in 2015 and it was a admin job um, and then later on um, I also helped out the job center because I needed some help. So it was it was sort of like my first introduction into the corporate world. And um, sooner or later, I tend to find there was like, for me, it was more racial diversity that was lacking for me. And it's something that I've noticed um, from sort of college to university. 
I think when I was finding the workplace, it was still something that I was like, okay, all right. Um, uh, but then why I why was at the co-op, I applied for different roles. Um, so I ended up working as a data analyst as well, because um, I, I love numbers. <laughs> um, it seemed like a natural transition to, um, to do. So um, I, I got into doing analytics, so I was, I don't know if anyone knew much about the co-op, so they're like very membership based, I was working in membership departments, so if anyone, if anyone ever did receive any emails around the time when I was at the co-op, I was one of the person that was assessing how many people opened their emails, how many people clicked true, if it was something based where we're advertising products for you to, to buy, um, and I really enjoyed it, but then I also got a new boss. But part of that new boss was uh, she was new to the business, new, new to the department, but because I was digital, they just used to come in this digital, she thought um, a website <laughs> was part of my role or something I could do um, because to her that was something digital, I should be able to do it. So she gave me a digital website to do and I was like, well, this is not really my job, but um, thank you. I guess I have no choice but to actually do it. <laughs> and and that, that was it, so I was like, okay, thanks. <laughs> um, I then went from having um, no experience in something to having this new thing that I had to do, and I was like, I was happy to, and that's how I actually found coding, and I'm actually glad she gave me that opportunity to actually find something that I love and I'm doing now. Um, so I did it for about over a year. I was helping different departments. They were sort of cutting costs at that time. Um, and it just sort of like, oh my God, I didn't know this is something I could do. I was like, oh, I didn't realize this was an option. And how fun it is. Because for me, when I hear about tech and um, I had dated someone that was actually, that was studying computer science in and uni but it made it sound so boring so I was like oh I could never do that but um, for me actually seeing what that entails changed my perception of what it's like to work in tech um, so I decided okay I'm gonna leave my job um, no plans uh, and I want to become a developer uh, fair enough I've been doing it on the job I really wanted to learn more get that immersive experience and luckily for me I also applied for some scholarship which I got so I took Originally, my plan was to take a year off, but luckily, about nine months in, I got approached by a company to say, we've got this role, I think it'd be perfect for it, because I was sharing some of the stuff I've been doing and learning. And that's how I started being a developer, really. And I got my first job in 2017. Even though it's something I've done in the past for the co-op, it was my first proper role that had developer in it. <laughs> um, and then from there, um, I remember I got my first job at the same time I also got another scholarship because I, I really just I was literally so obsessed with learning I wanted to learn everything <laughs> um, and I was doing my first role on the side and I was also um, I was also trying to inspire more people to be like oh my god tech is amazing this is some of the stuff I've been doing um, and then I, I, also, I was also getting a lot of questions and from there um, I decided to uh, launch Code Possible which is this site where you can go to that gives you lots of um, platforms where you can learn how to code. It's playing a lot of stuff to you as well. Um, um, I also, um, this was in 2018, um, and then I also switched company at that time also. Um, but um, during my time in my second role, I really struggled, not technically, more in terms of I was in an, I was, the only female in in a uh, sixteen in among sixteen developers in a part of an IT department for a company, and as much as I was very confident in my skills, um, I didn't feel very well. I, I didn't feel like I was taken seriously, and I was like, well, I wouldn't have got this job if I didn't know what I was doing. Um, I felt like I always had to talk a bit louder. I would sometimes talk to me, talk in meeting, I'll be ignored, and someone else will exact, say exactly what I've said. I'm like, that's literally what I just said five minutes ago. And for me, I really struggled with that. And I also had um, a supervisor, which wasn't really, it wasn't technical, and it was not the most, let's just it was it wasn't the nicest person, to be honest. <laughs> um, it, it, it wasn't capable of being a, what I would say, supervisor or someone that has leadership 
because he didn't really have the right skill to be a leader or knew how to manage anybody really. So I really struggled and I just left. And uh, previous to that, I had also launch code and stuff because um, I really wanted to do more with getting more women into tech because I was like, if this is the norm, then if there were more women at the table, I wouldn't be having issues like this because it would just be normal to have women in the in the room discussing technical stuff and not feeling like maybe you're not capable or know what you're talking about. So that was something that really inspired me behind starting code possible uh, code and stuff. And um, luckily, I also got my applied for a senior role because uh, it was something I felt like I could do. Um, I've always been that kind of person where I don't always feel like I have to meet all the criteria before I go for something. I feel like in any role you were in, there's always opportunity where you have to learn and grow. Um, and I always have this outlook and it doesn't hurt if you to apply for something if you feel like you're not 100% qualified or you just meet 80% of the criteria or so. Um, and when I actually left my role, I didn't actually even have an offer. I was just like, I'm happy. Uh, this is just not really a good environment I wanted to be in. So um, I left. Uh, but luckily, I actually got the role that I went for at DWP as a senior uh, front-end developer, and that was in 2019. So that's sort of like my journey into tech. So um, white tech has always been male-dominated, which is actually wasn't in the case if you look back in history. Um, but there, um, there are a lot more women that actually are joining the industry now, but still, men still outnumber women in tech roles. And one thing that I've also noticed about this is the side effect of that lack of diversity in tech. When you think about tech now, especially when it comes to mobile development or desktop, we all consume tech massively in day in day to day life, really. Um, like I literally, I spend like probably like over 12 hours on my phone. <laughs> and, and a lot of this is if there's that lack of diversity in people building this technology that where everybody's using day in to day out, there's a lot of biases that can be included and a lot of exclusion it can create. Um, and I said like having a whole male team isn't automatically a bad thing, but without the influence of women or those that belong to gender minority or different races, ability or disability, how are they able to then reflect that to the rest of the population if they don't have that people on the team building this um, helping to build this technology and I, I personally believe that technology has the potential to resolve a lot of the world's problem but it needs the right mix of people looking at the problem in the right way and then for me that's one of the things why diversity in tech is something that's massively important and something I'm always advocating for because when you think about how much we all consume tech now, it's really important that that representation is there at the table of people building this um, technology. Um, and one thing that I um, I think is diversity is the norm we all speak, but I think inclusion is the action that we actually need to take. And some of how we do that is by training and development. I think there needs to be more um, and I think personally for me, speaking from experience, I didn't think tech didn't sound fun to me, especially in high school or anything like that. It didn't sound like, it sounded like a really boring job. And there was that stereotype when you think about a developer, even nowadays, the developer is someone like t-shirt, um, not brush the hair in ages, beard, all that kind of stuff. So there needs to be more partnership and mentorship and education program for women that provides foundation for women to identify and prepare them for a successful career in technology. And I think that's another way of changing the industry really, because a lot of these roles are emerging, they are um, changing constantly every day. So I think technology is really, and uh, training and development opportunity is really important. Um, I think there also needs to be a massive diversity in leadership. Uh, when you think about people making all the decision, when you don't have diversity at that high level, it's it's rarely going to be reflected when you look down. And then it's also around recruitment. Um, um, high um, was um, as part of my role, I do quite a lot of um, recruitment for for my work. Um, and I remember um, in, um, interviewing a woman once, and she said, "This is the first time I've actually been on the on a interview and there's been a woman in the room and I was like wow that's 
and that was actually the same for me and I think for all the tech job interviews I've been in there's hardly been a woman in the room and I think it's that kind of change that needs to happen um, it's also about role model um, if we can see people higher up we're also going to want more people that are going to be like okay you know what I want to aspire to do that as well and it's um and it's important for diversity of thought there's that balance in styles and thought processes and how the whole team works and generally would create an environment that enables a female or minority or people of different abilities the race to continue to achieve and succeed in the workplace if the people leadership actually reflects them as well um, and one and another thing that I think is really important is if we need to start earlier um, and that takes me back to education because I feel like our education system is not preparing us for the future of work. Personally, I didn't think any of my high school education, excuse me, actually prepared me for work. Um, and I feel like currently we're very quite slow, like the curriculum is very slow to respond to change or emerging technology. It takes quite a while to adapt. Um, and I think school curriculums needs to offer like coding, um, co um, classes for beginners to help educate and empower children in technology um, and then also giving them curriculums in various programming languages and STEM lessons and hand-on activities. I think that's another way of changing that future pipeline um, and future talent as well where we start at that foundation when that foundation is high school education, primary school education um, and I think also the change needs to start with us uh, we need to be part of the solution and not part of the problem. It's not just up to educational providers, employ employers, the government to be responsible for building a system that helps more girls or women get into STEM. Or we must all take ownership of it and also be part of the problem. And part of that is being a role model. Um, we need more women in tech in order to get more women in tech. Um, we need to be able to inspire others on their journey to success. And this is something that I take very seriously. So since I started working at DWP, I've been the face of the tech uh, recruitment um, for the third time now. And I think that's really important because then when people are applying for a role, they can see a female developer and be like, oh yeah, you know what, I want to work there. They can see somebody and be like, okay, I'm not going to be the only person at the table. And then I think it's also important to also support our fellow women in and outside the workplace. Um, and also maybe even creating a community similar to me starting code and stuff that would help to support the women or purpose data that's giving people an opportunity to um, have the opportunity to be like, OK, you know what, I've never really considered this, but thank you for sharing this. And this is something that I want to do, because when I started sharing my journey, my cousin that was going to do nursing actually change a course in university. Now she's a second year student um, studying software development and she didn't really think it was something. But me explaining things I'm learning and breaking things down, she was like, oh, this is actually quite fun. And I think that's the little change where we're starting to be part of the change. And I think we shouldn't be afraid to break stereotypes. There's this amazing uh, quote that I've got there that when you exist in a space that one built for you, remember sometimes just being you is the revolution just being that first person there against that revolution where a lot of other women be like you know what she can do it i want to do it too um so i think we shouldn't let the fact that we might be the only woman in the room stop us from being ourselves um we shouldn't we should actually see it as a as a challenge not a problem um to and then maybe that would also open more room for more people to to be to be like you know what I can do it I, I want this is I, I, I can see somewhere there and I feel like that's where I want to be and, and I, I think it's also important not to under, underestimate ourselves um, there's a there's quite a few studies that show that women tend to underestimate their abilities and women tend to overestimate them um, and it's sort of one of the reasons when women are applying for jobs and they don't meet all the requirements where they don't they don't tend to go for it where men will just think oh I can do that I can do that I can't do this but oh well I still apply for it and I think it's just having that confidence as well um, even if you don't know a lot we need to take ownership in what we know and seize the opportunity and be like you know what well, I don't know this but this is what I know and I'm very proud of that um, and one thing I would also say is to get a mentor um, I, I've had a mentor I've, I am a mentor 
Um, and I think it's so important having that extra bit of support. And I think even mentoring someone that's up and coming in their journey, either in data, AI, um, software development, mobile development, just having that extra support. And I think it goes such a long way. And last but not least, I always see, <laughs> I always feel like this needs uh, something I always tell people like men and the problem is the system. Men and the problem. I've had quite a lot of men that have actually helped me in my journey in tech. Of course, there's going to be some men out there that aren't, and I've had experience of that as well. Where, and I think that's just the case for anything really. That you're going to get some bad apples and good apples, and that's just. But generally, men aren't the problem, and we we shouldn't buy into the vibes that we have to overcome men in order to be a successful woman in tech, or in order for there to be more um, diversity in tech. We need to bring them along because we can't actually create more diversity in tech or more inclusion if we don't actually bring the men on the journey with us and be like, this is this is how you can help. Like for coding stuff, a lot of our mentors are actually men. They're willing to help to help more women and non-binary um, people learn how to code. And I think that's important to bring them along on that journey where they can actually learn how it's acceptable is to speak to women and how because it's not then it's not just like a guy club anymore you're changing that perception of um of them as well of seeing women capable of being able to be very technical and they can handle their own so i think that's also important as well um and that's it for me really <laughs> um does anyone have any question i don't know if there were some questions in the chat before thank you so much Faye. Uh, we only have a comment from Zoe who says she used to work in membership at the Co-op in 2002. So oh, hello. I think I joined. Shows how old I am now, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, I do have a question though. Well, actually, just an observation really. So I really like two of the things that you said really resonated with me. The first was the 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 developer with a t-shirt and scruffy hair i am also i work alongside another government digital department and that is what i see walking down the corridor i'm afraid to say um however i do see women but they tend to be squashed into the product manager roles in the middle so that they're kind of like the people who get everyone else to do the work which is quite quite a female trait really like yeah the pa of the team almost telling everyone else what to do so I wondered how it how it how it looks in in the DWP digital sort of with the gender spread because because certainly what I've seen in the department that I work uh, alongside is that developers I, I don't think I've seen female developer I've seen lots of uh, product managers and then I've seen a few delivery managers but just wondered what it's like there. Sadly, that's the case at the moment. So my team, so I'm actually the front um, front end developer across three teams. Well, actually, made that four now. <laughs> um, and sadly, it's my team. All my teams are very heavily female dominated. Like it's literally like eighty percent women and twenty percent men. But it's sort of like our product owner is a female, our agile developer is a female, our BAs are females, our QA is a female. I'm literally the only female developer. But I do know some of the departments are starting to, because I did like a whole front end meetup earlier this year just to see what the departments are doing. Um, and it was amazing just to not <laughs> be go to, because sometimes I go on training and I'm literally the only woman at the, in the, that enters that bad. People say, oh, are you in the right room? And I'm like, well, nobody comes into the wrong room nowadays, do they? <laughs> and that's all be my, but now when I create, uh, when I did that meetup earlier in the year, I was very happy to see there were like five other front ends across the department, uh, fair enough, they came from, there was two from Sheffield, one in Leeds, and I think one in Newcastle or two in Newcastle. So that actually made me happy. Even though they weren't like two on a team, they were like one person on a team. I think for me, that is sort of like an improvement and that is, um, and that's changing really. And I think that's why it's really important to have this training opportunities. Um, and I think for a lot of actual female developers that I know in Manchester, they actually tend to be like one or two on a team of like 10 males. <laughs> but And I think we shouldn't let that stop us. If you are interested in being a developer, don't let the fact that you might be the only female in the room, do be that change um, that might inspire another person to be like, okay, maybe. And, and I think 
being a senior in my role, that's one thing I'm trying now in terms of recruitment. Um, I, um, recently, we've got another role coming up and I've reached out to female um, front ends on LinkedIn and be like, we've got this job. It be, would be nice for you to ap ap um, apply to it as well. So I think that's what's really important. And it's something that I've also changed around. It's really hard to change stuff when you work in government. <laughs> but um, I've, I've been trying my little bit. I've been speaking to a head of role around um, apprenticeship, trying to get more younger um, people that are new to the industry in and things like that um, and I think that's where it's really important where even if you're that one person in the room you can make so many changes and be that change and try and get more people in the room really so I'm really okay sorry. sorry I was just going to say the other thing that, I was gonna, that really resonated with me is he talks about going for a job even though you're not fully qualified that I, this, the first time that I'm going to go for a job that I'm not fully qualified for and I've got the application and I haven't sent it yet. <laughs> but I'm going to send it tomorrow do morning it. now. Oh. Do it. <laughs> I think for any, there's, um, fingers crossed, there's, there's always a room for you to learn regardless. Even if you have all the skills, there's always going to be things that you have to learn. So don't let the fact that you don't know this. Um, and I think it's one thing we're starting to do at DWP where we're not we having that where it's necessary and an essential. And then it's like, not everything is like, oh, you need to have all this list. And I think that's really important as well. Um, being able to say like, you don't need to have all this. This is just, we only need like this couple of essentials. And then the rest is something you can build on once you get in and we can support mm. you. On that. So don't let the fact that you don't meet everything, just go for it, you never know. Um, my mum always say, you never know if you don't ask. <laughs> and if I, if, I can, if I can add to this, I think as women, we also tend to then, like, you know, try and point it out because we want to be so honest. And that's, that's also not the best thing to do for, if you want to get a job. So, like, uh, focus on your strengths uh, in, the, in the interview. Yeah. And the letters rather than, oh, yeah, but I, I just wanted to say that I can't do this. <laughs> yeah, we need, to take, we need to take some of the skills from blokes to bullshit and lie a little bit more I think totally yeah <laughs> yeah um we've got another question from Jackie um you are muted Jackie can you hear me now yes brilliant thank you very much um hi Faye my name's Jackie um and I've sort of been on the periphery of this group for a long time and this is the first time I've had opportunity to join one of the meetups um okay so I'm I'm going to be a bit provocative okay because I think discussions help from having different points of view and Faye I was really struck by your trajectory into the job that you're doing now um, and you said that, you know, you, you started off doing one degree and you'd gone into education and then you ended up at the co-op and then you started learning to code and that's when you sort of realised it was something you were interested in and the rest, as it were, is history. So um, the provocative statement I'm going to make is that I think, um, so I, I teach social science students, okay? My background is maths and computing, but I now teach social science students how to do data analysis. And I've just actually been awarded with a national prize for the work that I've been doing for the last six years. And it's been through getting undergraduate students into the workplace to do what you call immersion activities. I love that phrase. I call them paid internships, but essentially they spend eight weeks doing a data driven research project where they get all of that mentoring and support that you were talking about. And it's um, a head turning experience for many of them who come back and realize that they can do, uh, they, they can do data analysis and they can learn to code. Not all of them learn to code, but some of them do. And then they go on and use those skills in their final year. And then some go into careers in uh, the, the data space. Um, and it worries me that we still have so much emphasis on finding STEM students when actually I think you've just given us a perfect example of students who have the ability and competence um, and capacity to develop into developers into tech people and I don't hear enough people talking about that and I think we have a real problem with the pipeline and so I've been trying to think about how we can develop new 
opportunities for good students to get into data-driven careers. And then I even went into a government department myself and did um, a six-month secondment with the data science campus team who work across all government departments and tried to provoke them to think about where the talent can come from. And it seems to me we have a sort of mismatch. We were looking for talent from a certain group of people who we call STEM predominantly, but actually what we're failing to do is look over to other people who are substantively interested in inequalities or you know, education or um, gender differences and all the things that we're interested in, who happen to be studying social science, and then we could train them up. So I was really interested in your thoughts about what we as a group collectively could learn from your experience and do differently. So I think you've sort of, you know, led the way, but what can we be doing more of collectively? Because that's what I'm interested in doing. I think it's just around changing the bias. I think for me generally, the reason I probably didn't go into this, uh, I really love science. I did double science in school. But um, when we had career days and stuff like that, it was, it was mostly men that came in. They were like IT and um, they didn't even seem like that excited. But I think that was just the kind of people they are. They're just really shy. And I was like, well, they seem like really like bored. I don't definitely want to do that job. And I think we definitely need to change that bias. And this is where experience come in. We need to, it needs to be very hands-on showing them what's actually like, not what they think it's like or what media or what perception they might have seen on social media with the memes and stuff of what is actually like to work in tech. But having that immersive experience, you can definitely um, uncover so many talents if, like people might think all oh, right I actually quite enjoyed that and I think for me that was what it was um if it was something that I've been pushed into I probably wouldn't have gone into it but it was something that I had to do on the job and I and as I started to do it and I was like oh my god it's actually quite fun this is not what I thought it would be because I thought it'd just be like something so boring <laughs> honestly that was my perception but as soon as I got into it and I was like all oh, right it's, it's it's different and I think that's where it, it needs to not just even be about STEM, it needs to just showing them what actually entails. And then you might even get more people more interested in it because I think at the moment, like working in tech and all that kind of stuff, everyone just sees it. Like even when I was talking to my nieces and nephew, they just see it as like a man's job. Um, and I think it's around changing that perception of what they might think it entails and showing them role models in tech that are female or different backgrounds and be like, she's doing this job and this is what day-to-day -day job is and this is this is what you need and stuff like that. Thank you. It's about visibility, isn't it? As much as anything, yeah. it's about making it uh, possible for people to see. Brilliant. I, I, I'm going to connect with you afterwards because I've got some ideas. Thank you. Definitely happy to. Wonderful. You're getting some virtual claps here. Uh, as well as on the chat, uh, people are uh, very inspired by the by your story, Faith. So uh, thanks a lot for sharing. Um, do we have any other questions? I think we've got probably time for for one more, if there are any. If not, we will give Faye a virtual clap and hand it over to Hannah. Thank you so much. Um, can everyone hear me okay? I'm just looking at Rachel because she's been my signifier of like thumbs up cool. Great. Um, so, um, wow, uh, what great talks already. Um, and uh, yeah, d d really delighted to be here um, and chat to you all. Um, so I'm going naked and I mean no slides, don't worry. Um, um, and um, yeah, I, I suppose I'm coming at this from a, a slightly different angle. I am um, coming at this more broadly. I'm a DNI specialist, so I'm going to be talking to you about. If you can hear that noise, it's my dog um, who suddenly decided to wake up as I've started to talk. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about um, data in DNI and how it's really important that organisations have a real focus on data. So yeah, I'm not a data specialist. I'm a DNI specialist. So. Um, and I'm going to tell you, I guess, a bit of my story and why that links to kind of what I do and why I think this stuff is so important. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey, why it's so important that employers use data to make people feel included and how data, whilst it isn't all you need when you're thinking about d and um, it unlocks the key to so many important conversations and gives you like a clear and tangible evidence base from which to move forward in your d and journey. 
So I'm Hannah Jepson. Um, I'm an out and proud lesbian. I am a business psychologist. I'm the founder of LGBT Ed. Uh, we're a national LGBT organisation that works across the education sector. We support LGBT educators to be authentic in their schools and colleges. I am a published academic author. My research concerns the career experiences of gay women in the workplace. Uh, I'm the lead coach for a national LGBT inclusion in education award and I'm the director of my own business called Engaging for Success and we specialize in leadership and talent, assessment and selection, uh, diversity and inclusion and also developing LGBTQ specific mentoring programs. So my specialism around d &I sits within LGBTQ plus and that's the angle from which I'll be kind of talking to you today. Um, so a little bit about my story, I guess, um, which starts in Wakefield uh, in West Yorkshire, for those of you who know it or don't, um, which is famous for rhubarb, um, cruise ship sensation Jane McDonald, and uh, frankly, not a lot else. Um, and actually, there wasn't really a safe queer space for me growing up in Wakefield. Um, absolutely no queer role models um, and frankly, not a huge amount of hope. And I knew I liked girls from a really young age. I knew when I watched um, Les Miserables and I fell in love with Alex Sharp, who was the girl who played Eponine and I still remember her name. Um, I knew when I fell in love with Ellie Jones, who was a girl in my theatre group. And I knew when I watched the pantomime uh, as a young girl and felt really desperate to be the girl playing the prince because she got to kiss the girl at the end. I knew, but I kept it to myself for uh, years, pretended to be someone else for years. And pretending is really hard. Pretending takes effort and energy and headspace that you can't afford to give away when you're revising or taking exams or applying for university or jobs or trying to do your job. Um, and so I came out of college and all was kind of well, but I very much legged it back into the closet when I started the world of um, work, which is where the pantomime, I guess, really began. Um, I was performing for a really long time, making up boyfriends. Um, Tom, the most significant boyfriend uh, of mine to date at that point um, had a whole backstory. So for some reason, I didn't just use my girlfriend's story and switch the names in. I literally made up a whole different life for Tom. Like Tom was a doctor, his dad was a vicar, I have no idea. Um, the time and energy it took to lie meant I, I definitely wasn't doing my job to the best of my ability because every day I was thinking about the next lie and I hated myself and my life because of it. Because actually it's those kind of little conversations that matter isn't it it's those kind of water cooler moments or when we when we could stand around a water cooler together um the kind of how was your weekend um the yeah i'm going to that thing after work too that's what makes up your experiences at work actually isn't it you you might come home and occasionally tell your partner or your housemate wow i sat through this great powerpoint today but mostly you don't mostly you say this hilarious thing happened today or i had a great chat with sarah today and i learned this new thing about them in our one-to-one -one because it's the relationships that actually matter, isn't it? And if you aren't bringing your genuine self to work, as I wasn't to those conversations and to those relationships, then it does really make it difficult or even impossible to form genuine, long lasting and meaningful relationships at work or wherever you are. Um, back then when the relationship didn't work out, I was dealing with A, having to go to work and do a good job, B, feeling a huge sense of fear because um, I'd moved hundreds of miles to be away from my friends and um, I was fearful about my future and see I was having to lie about the whole thing. Um, so I would be in conversations where the girls at work with me would say, oh, men are all whatever they are. And I would have to kind of agree along with them, even though I knew this was a, a complete lie. So it was really awful. It made me, it made me really ill. It made me anxious um, every second of every day at that moment in my life. And it was the worst, it was one of the worst times in my young adult um, life. And actually those first few years after university shouldn't feel so painful. Um, they should feel exciting and liberating and character making, um, but not for me and not for many of the people I know who are part of the LGBTQ community. So after that moment and a great deal of pain and reflection, I vowed uh, never to hide who I was ever again. Uh, I'd be out and proud and I would act as a role model to my colleagues, uh, however difficult that was at the time, because if I'd have had just one person telling me or showing me that it's okay, you can be you, then I think I'd probably be telling you a very different story today. And I think that's the reason that I work in diversity and inclusion and the reason I'm driven every day to help organisations really understand their employee base so they can create environments in which people can be their authentic selves. And it's absolutely incumbent on organisations to do this work and to do it really well. Um, and that brings me to the data, I guess, because 
at the start of my career journey and still now, I am a data point. I am. I tick a lot of boxes as someone who is queer, as someone who is uh, gender non-conforming. And if the organisations I started out in had taken that data gathering seriously, as opposed to seeing it as some kind of perfunctory tick box exercise, or for some actually not gathering that data at all, um, and they'd used it to actually educate themselves about who they had in their organisations and therefore how to include them, um, then I might not have felt the need to cover up such a huge part of who I was and am. And when I talk about the data in DNI, I'm talking about both the stories and the statistics. Um, it's important to know the makeup of your organisation, not only to see whether or not you are representative of your customer or client base, um, and if you're not, then to work out what interventions you can put in place to be more representative but to use the knowledge of the richness that exists within your organization to make it a better place to work for everyone and ultimately a more successful one. When I'm talking to organizations, I talk to them about data informed action. So before you take any action on your DNI journey, you absolutely must gather as much data as you can, both qualitative and quantitative. Remember, I'm talking about those stories and statistics. You need to get a clear idea of the current state before you can move forward with the right solutions. So use the data to meaningfully inform your inclusion journey. Um, and when you're unpicking that data, don't analyze each group in isolation. Drill down and cross-reference multiple factors so you can really understand the experiences of not only your female colleague, but your black trans colleague who works a job share, for example. Um, we don't live single issue lives, so don't cut the data in that way. Be creative in the way you mine that data so you can see how those intersecting identities cut across each other. That way you can approach your diversity journey through an intersectional lens. Um, the benefit of adop adopting this kind of intersectional approach to this is that it provides an understanding of issues that is much closer to the lived experiences of those groups that you're interested in, um, which allows you to develop effective strategies to address them. Um, a common perception with organisations that I talk to is, is that kind of research um, into intersectionality is really complicated um, and in practice actually conducting intersectional research is not necessarily complicated um, provided that you, you know, formulate adequate research questions, choose your methods carefully, interpret your results from an intersectional perspective. Um, so as I said before, to be clear, I'm not a data specialist, I'm a DNI specialist who works with organisations to help them gather the data they need to start their DNI journey. Um, so I'm hearing this phase, um, this phrase statement fatigue a lot at the moment and the idea that organisations are making big bold statements but haven't gathered any data um, or actually addressed the issues that they might face internally when it comes to DNI, um, and that can feel disingenuous at best and be damaging at worst for minoritised or marginalised groups. Um, so back kind of if I can to LGBTQ professionals, we know that there is a huge problem with the underrepresentation of LGBT community and leadership in organisations. Um, but before we look at that, we need to shine a light on that kind of stifling effect of um, hetero and cis normativity. Assumptions, um, stereotypes, prejudices aside, you can't actually see LGBT people. And so we have to choose to share who we are every day in every new job, with every new colleague and every new team. Um, and in doing so, we are exposing ourselves to judgment, intolerance, and sometimes bigotry. And they are not words we should be associating with organizations in 2020. Um, and in my work, I help to, um, I, I aim to help organizations get better at collecting vital data for those non-visible minority groups. Um, so yeah, I think just a final thought from me before we kind of head into any further discussions, which is that those organizations that are doing this really well simply say to me, it's just who we are. It's part of our values and we really do live by them. It isn't about quick fixes or one-offs. It isn't about tokenism. It's about clear and consistent focused action at all levels. It can be done, but it requires effort, understanding and passion. And that includes the level of sophistication with which we collect, analyze and interpret our data as the first part of our inclusion and diversity journey. So um, yeah, that's kind of it from me, a little bit of um, a brief uh, introduction to me, what I do in my story. I hope that you commit to some action today in your organizations or share what you're doing with the kind of virtual room here. Um, and we all kind of continue to make a change for all the brilliantly talented uh, LGBTQ people who just want to feel valued respected and included when they go to work. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for listening um, and uh, I'll take any questions if you've got any. Thank you so much, Anna. That was, that was a great talk and also very brave to do it without slides. I'm not a big slides fan these days. I just, it's too much on my screen going on. Oh yeah.
Do we have any questions for Hannah? I first kind of just want to thank you for, for getting really vulnerable and sharing all of that. Um, because I think, because part of her plus data is we want to provide space where people can talk about that sort of thing. And I think it's really important what you mentioned about how um, some identities aren't visible, but creating those spaces where people are able to to talk about them and share them and 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 be able to you know express their their lived experience. I think is really important. So I just want to thank you a lot for for sharing that. Oh, you're welcome. Hi. Um. This is Tam, I was the first speaker. I just wanted to say that the part where you were saying that you were making up lies and it felt like so much effort and you maybe weren't doing your actual job properly because of all that effort. Um, I do resonate with that because it's so much effort to pretend to be someone that you're not and you can only really be yourself. So, so yeah, that, that, I did like that point that you made. I like the whole talk actually. So, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and I think it it kind of is that thing around. I guess that term, um, like uh, sometimes people people refer to it as um, maybe paranoid cognition or something like stereotype threat. So we're 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 worrying before you know that organisation that I worked in. There was no over. Um, LGBT phobia at all that I recognized but it was the sort of me preempting that there might be so deciding to just edit edit myself and I think when we're when you are a part of a um, minoritized or marginalized group whatever that is whether it's visible or not you mm. you try and fit in with the dominant um, group and so therefore you are you're muting a part of yourself or you're editing that and and also you're taking up a lot of headspace doing that, which means you can't give your full self to to your job in the same way that someone who isn't part of those groups can. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it 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 definitely like it's really important for me to share my story because I know there's lots of people still feeling like that, like they're hiding parts of who they are. And I think we, you know, it's it's a cliche, but it's true. It's it's you know, people just perform better when they can be themselves, and that's that's a fact, you know. And diverse organisations are better, so that's you know. So that's, that's the reason, you know, it's not, it's not my opinion, you know, the research says it. So, yeah. yeah. Um, I've, um, I loved what you were saying about doing some cross-sectional sort of data analysis to find the real lived in experience, the real lived experience. Um, for me personally, I used to organize um, a meetup, a group, a group meetup in Manchester for women who were childless, who didn't have children. That's like a diversity issue in HR that is kind of the biggest diversity issue that they've never sort of heard of. And it's really interesting you talk about um, going across things because there tends to be an assumption that heterosexual women in the workplace are the parents and the LGBTQ are not parents. And actually, there's not that, but actually there's a crossover. I have a lot of similar needs as a non-parent as lgbtq people who are non-parents or or the same thing about access to fertility treatments etc cetera, etc cetera, and things that then impact you know workplace stuff so i just kind of wondered whether or not that's there's there's any sort of any awareness in any of the companies that you've worked with of that kind of parent non-parent sort of diversity difference amongst women especially. Yeah, I, I, I think I'd agree with you, Zoe, that it's one of the last things to be spoken about. It's, it's not, you know, I think people are the certain, you know, I think just kind of despite trying to get away from it, there's a kind of hierarchy of these things that organisations are more comfortable in talking about. Um, and I think that that comes down to that sort of, yeah, that heteronormative assumption that's still really pervasive in organisations. Um, a couple of organizations in the charity sector that I work with are doing some of that work that kind of cross-sectional stuff and, and cutting the data and, and analyzing listening to people's stories in that way but um no lots lots aren't um you're right there's still that real assumption across those different groups yeah 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 but um, I'll change that I will work to change it We've got a question from Jackie on the chat. So she says that was fantastic. She was struck by you saying each day you need to uncover who you are, which must be exhausting for LGBTQ plus people. 
Um, she asks if there are ways organizations can help to support this. Uh, and she also mentions that there's a line in one of her favorite songs uh, that reminded her of, uh, that, that your talk reminded her of. Uh, and it is, if you hide yourself wherever you go, are you really ever there? Um, so yeah, the question is, are there ways organizations can help support this? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, thank you so much. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I think there's, the thing I would say, and I guess I refer to it when I talked about that statement fatigue, is that it's, it's blooming hard work. And I think organizations who think they're going to get some quick wins or quick fixes, they're not, you know, this stuff isn't going away. Um, this stuff is a really long journey. So organizations who take it really seriously, organizations who invest in it, organizations who have someone doing this work. So rather than having someone do it as a kind of add on to their role. Um, and I think, as I said, I, I genuinely, I genuinely believe I'm not saying this because I'm in this virtual room now, like, looking at the data is the very first step, like making a commitment and then just, just diving into the data and going, what is going on here and cutting it in, you know, like I said, being creative in the way that you're cutting going, okay, who have we got here? And, and how, how are those different things intersecting? Um, and then I think it's more about, it isn't about these big splash, having a rainbow truck at pride or whatever. Um, it's about like the quiet grind of like looking at your policies, looking at your processes, how, inclusive are they um and if, so so lots of people say well we've got a statement on our website that says we welcome all you know people from all backgrounds but if you haven't done the work on your policies and your processes and, and you haven't collected any data that that statement is is as i said before it's disingenuous but it but it, at best and it's damaging at worst so so what organizations can do is um knuckle down and do the work because it's, it's, it takes time and, um, and acknowledge that it's a journey. And I think for me as well, I guess the other thing on this is that the way, the way I approach organizations that I work with, and I do work pan diversity, I don't just do LGBT stuff, but it's like, you've got to meet people where that they are as well. And a really, a phase point really resonated with me as well. This isn't about disenfranchising uh, the white straight cis men. Um, actually it's about helping them understand and bringing them along with us. So yeah, I think it's acknowledging that it's hard work um, and being prepared to roll your sleeves up um, to, to understand how you can change your, your organization to be more inclusive. Can I come in and respond? Sure. Thank you, Hannah. Wow, I'm blown away, you're so erudite and everything you say is just so critically important. And you know, you're right about the data analysis, but it's also about the qualitative data, the lived experience and how it affects people. And I work in a university, a big university, University of Manchester. And of course we have a diversity policy and procedures and um, uh, I think we call it dignity at work or something. But that only goes so far. And some of this is about calling out behavior. And, you know, that takes a certain mindset and a, a certain type of brave person to do that and I think the University of Manchester is a fantastic place to work but it's full of my uh, well male pale stale you know often bullies often people who have um, got to where they are because they have privilege and it's incredibly hard even with incredibly tele intelligent people to sometimes surface some of what you're talking about and I just wonder if have you Got any tips and techniques for even those of us who are really strong minded, really willing to challenge, really willing to sort of um, fight the good fight to actually show up people for, for what they are in a, a supportive way in all the ways that you've talked about? Because that to me is the biggest challenge. How do you sort of call out people who are so entrenched in their views and don't understand that they've got privilege you know to see what it's like for the people I've, I've recently been thinking about reverse mentoring and that's where this thinking is coming from yeah um wow it's really difficult I think um I guess lots of thoughts going through my mind um I think when I talk about this stuff I talk about the, the three cases for DNI, so the moral case the legal case and the business ca case um and I think for some people, um, like if they don't get that it's just the right thing to do, like maybe you need to, maybe the journey's a bit longer with, with them. Then if they don't, if they can't sort of read the research that stares you in the face and says D diverse and inclusive organizations are better and the, there's myriad research that says that, then actually, you know, it's also just, it is the legal case, right? The Equality Act is 10 years old and 
you've got to do it. You know, you've got to abide by that. You know, it's, you know, for public sector organisations, it's a public sector equality duty. You have to, um, you know, section 149, uh, I've read it a lot. Um, you, you know, you have to do that stuff. So I think there are three cases. I think the other thing is stories is, is and that's why I do allow myself to be vulnerable and sharing those stories because you can't argue with the real lived experiences of a human looking at you saying, I have experienced this discrimination because of who I am or who I chose to spend my life with or whatever. So I think stories is a gentle way to do it. Um, I do think it's it's really difficult. The other thing which we can chat offline about, but the other thing I, I use a model of called, is called conversational intelligence. And that's about um, how you move through kind of from a very transactional conversation, which is tell kind of tell sell to a to a conversation where you're co-creating together and how you're 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 learning from each other. So when I'm working in rooms of white, straight, cisgendered, middle-aged, middle class men, um, we do that conversational intelligence piece along with those stories about because actually sometimes it's just that they haven't seen it or experienced it. And that's okay. You know, it's not their fault that that's what they were born into, but showing them and telling them and also maybe using some models to, to help guide a framework of how to have better conversations, I think is, is the way I would do it. Brilliant. Thank you so much. No worries. Do we have any other questions? We've got uh, five minutes left still this evening. I talk for hours. I talk for hours. <laughs> Hi Hannah, I was just, um, it's Kiss and I was just going to make an observation um, which is I think it is really hard for people to talk about poor experiences they've had in the workplace because there's so much emphasis on not um, bad mouthing your employer um, and how that is therefore seen to reflect negatively on you but I think it is really important to challenge the behaviours, um, you know the values or the, the commitments may be saying one thing but the behaviours in the workplace can be very different and can be um, not very consistent even within one organisation but unless you actually make that visible and start to do something about it then the situation won't improve. Um, so I was just wondering if you've got any suggestions um, around how you how you tackle that stuff um, in a way that that doesn't then reflect on you as the individual. Yeah really really good question and I, I, I totally hear you that it's sometimes it's hard to, to, to say that um, but actually the the I think I said this in in the, in the talk, but the the onus is on is on leadership really to create a space where like I, I talk I use the phrase like have create safe spaces to have uncomfortable conversations and actually it's the onus on the leadership to to be able to do that and create and in schools lots of the work I do in, in education we talk about lived not laminated values so like in a way it's you don't necessarily have to share your negative experience that you've had per se but but you have every right to challenge leadership if the values aren't being uh, lived and breathed um, in your organization. So I think, you know, if, 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 you, if there's an uncomfortableness about sharing your negative experiences um, because you don't want to go down some sort of, you know, you don't want to go down a formal route there, but actually it's about trying to set up a, a, a conversation with, you know, your mentor, your line manager, whatever, to just question and nudge um, uh, whether the organization is living and breathing those values um, so I, th I think those things can be really hard um, and if, if there's a fear that that will come back and bite you then then even more so but I think how can you in your position from wherever you are nudge and encourage leadership to think about whether their values real, uh, you know are um, embedding diversity and inclusion within the organization but it's a tough one I totally get that and I hear you Great conversation. Do we have uh, any any final questions? If not, um, thank you so much uh, from from all the organizers to your speakers, uh, to our speakers, as well as uh, yeah. Let's give a virtual clap to Hannah for being so open and um, for 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 yeah uh, sparking this great conversation that we had tonight. Um, yeah, thanks also for everyone's comments on chat as well as, uh, as, well as um, yeah, in, um, in, in person here. Um, yeah, it's been a really inspiring and cool event. Um, so um, yeah, thanks a lot for, for all your contributions. And if you want to hang around uh, for, for having informal chats um, and, and networking, please do so. I was going to say thank you to you guys for organizing this as well. <laughs> thanks so much for speaking.
Uh, Vanessa, much. did you have a question? You have your hand raised. Yeah, I just wanted to ask. Um, I've noticed you're recording because I, I came in really late, but this conversation has been really interesting and I missed the most part of it. Just wondered if you've got a link for the recording. Um, we like will LinkedIn? make that available probably tomorrow. Oh, that'd be great. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. It was great to see everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Bye. 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 Bye.